Okay, and considering Calvin, we're going to look at five things. First of all, briefly at the context, the world in which he was uh, born, the situation in which he operated. Secondly, we're going to look at his life and, and, and what, what happened to him and so on. And then we're going to look at his writings, the, different, the many different things that he wrote, and then a bit about his theology. And finally, the uh, afterlife of Calvin, if you like, the whole question of Calvin and Calvinism, which remains a very vexed issue on which there are uh, very contrasting views from different quarters. So, first of all, Calvin's context, the time in which he was born. Um, Calvin was born at the time of the Reformation and is one of the, obviously, one of the big players in the Reformation. Um, now, the, the Reformation began traditionally, and this is quite a reasonable starting date, in 1517, to be precise, October the 31st, when Luther probably nailed up his, his 95 theses on the door of the castle church at Wittenberg. And that's traditionally seen as the beginning of the Reformation. Uh, the beginning phase extends for about four years till 1521. In 1521, Luther stood before the, the Emperor Charles V and the Imperial Diet, uh, the famous Diet of Worms, where, uh, where he was called upon to recant. And he gave a little speech which, uh, which didn't end with the words, here I stand, I can do no other, but that pretty much sums up what it was that he said. So that's the beginning of the Reformation, 1517 to 21. Um, but it wasn't only with Luther that the Reformation began. Around the same time, uh, and fairly independently of Luther, in Zurich in Switzerland, uh, Zwingli was also coming to Reformation ideas. And Zwingli came to very similar ideas, uh, as I say, about the same sort of time, and pretty much independently of Luther. So right from the beginning with the Reformation, you have these two strands, uh, Luther and, uh, and Lutheranism, uh, and with Zwingli you have the Reformed tradition, uh, which began in Switzerland and spread elsewhere. Okay, so where does Calvin fit into all this? Uh, Calvin was born in 1509. So uh, when Luther nailed up those theses, Calvin was only eight years old. So, as you can imagine, he wasn't exactly a participant in the early years of the Reformation. Um, so Calvin is very definitely a second-generation reformer. Uh, Calvin is also just one of many second-generation reformers, and we'll be revisiting that theme in the final section when we look at the afterlife of Calvin and the relation between Calvin and what is, uh, what is known as Calvinism. So having seen the context, as, as I said, Calvin was born in 1509. <clears throat> he was born in the little town of Noyon in uh, Picardy in the north of France. That's over to the east of Paris in the direction of the Netherlands. And he went off at uh, well, what today would be an early age, uh, went off to study at the university. And uh, he studied at Paris uh, and then also at uh, Orléans and Bourges, all, all of course in France. And he studied law, uh, not his first choice, but his father wanted him to study law. Uh, law, obviously, is, is not a bad subject from the point of view of, of, of a wealthy profession then as now. But uh, Calvin's heart wasn't so much in that. And when his father died, he took the freedom that uh, brought, uh, took that as an opportunity to study theology instead. Now, there's another factor involved in all this. And that is, at some point in the early 30s, 1530s, and we don't know exactly when, uh, he underwent a conversion. Um, Calvin generally didn't have very much to say of an autobiographical nature, uh, but in his preface to his Psalms commentary, he does uh, write a bit about his, his, his previous life, and there he gives an account of his conversion uh, in the following terms. He says, Since I was too obstinately devoted to the superstitions of popery, to be easily extricated from so profound an abyss of mire, God, by a sudden conversion, subdued and brought my mind to a teachable frame, which was more hardened in such matters than might have been expected from one of my early period of life. So Calvin uh, expressed his conversion in terms of, of being set free from idolatry, so that, seemed, that was for him the, the key issue. Um, uh, so. He, he, he regarded the sort of Roman Catholic practice as, as idolatrous, and for him embracing the Reformation was, was turning away from that. And at Paris, he became associated with the uh, Reform movement. And that got him into some trouble, because there was a man called Cop, uh, 
who gave a, a, a speech at Paris which had rather too much uh, of uh, Protestantism in it for the likings of the authorities. And Kopp was forced to flee at very short notice after giving this speech, and Calvin also took off at the same time, uh, thought that his, his life was in danger, which, which indeed it was, because at that time uh, people were being burnt at the stake for having Protestant ideas. So Calvin was, was clearly identified with the Protestant movement and uh, had to, to, to flee, flee from Paris initially. And then a little later on, there was um, uh, a further incident uh, in which some people produced some rather inflammatory um, tracts or posters uh, denouncing the Roman Catholic mass as an idolatry. And these were put around Paris, including uh, one on the, king's, the door of the king's bedchamber. Uh, and the king was not amused, and there was a further crackdown and so Calvin at that point deemed it prudent uh, not just to depart from Paris, but to depart from France. And at that point he, he went to, uh, to Basel in, in Switzerland and settled down, as he thought it was going to be, to uh, a lifetime of, of study and writing. And that was his, his, his goal for himself. Around this time, uh, 1535, so, so, so not long after he had left France, uh, he completed the first edition of his Institutes, uh, completed in 1535, but although it wasn't published until the next year. And uh, then, he, then he carried on uh, working on uh, other writings as well. And all seemed to be going well with his life of retirement and study until he had to go on a journey and was forced by uh, just a little local war that was going on to make a detour and to go through Geneva, where he intended to stay for the night. Uh, however, there was, uh, the, the Reformation had just begun in Geneva, and this was led by an older man by the name of Farel. And Farel knew about Calvin, he knew about Calvin's work, and he saw here um, somebody who could be quite useful for the church in Geneva. So um, this is Calvin's own words again. This is what uh, happened. Farel had discovered that my, my, this is Calvin, my heart was set upon devoting myself to private studies for which I wished to keep myself free from other pursuits. And finding that he gained nothing by entreaties, Pharaoh proceeded to utter an imprecation that God would curse my retirement and the tranquility of the studies which I sought if I should withdraw and refuse to give assistance when the necessity was so urgent. By this imprecation I was so stricken uh, with terror that I des desisted from the journey which I had undertaken. Uh, so Pharaoh said to Calvin, look, we need you, your calling is to serve God here in Geneva. And as, as he said, Calvin was inclined to ignore that, um, but Farrell uttered those words and, 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 and said that God would curse his studies if he was so selfish as, as to neglect the calling. So Calvin uh, joined the, the ministry at Geneva as somebody who was going to do some teaching there and spent the next two years of his life there. Only two years, though, because a, a couple of years later, he and Farrell had a, a bust up with the city authorities and were both sent off into exile. Now, the issue was one that was going to recur later throughout Calvin's life, and that was the question of the, the independence of the church. Um, in the 16th century, in, 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 uh, with the 16th century Protestantism, there was no question of separation of church and state, like um, in the United States, for instance, and other countries. Uh, there is a sort of legal separation between the two, and um, they, they go their separate ways. That wasn't at all possible then. Um, it wasn't as much separation uh, as independence. If, if you like, you can look at it like this. The um, relation between church and state was rather like that between the Treasury and the Foreign Office, say. Uh, well, the Treasury and the Foreign Office can't, are not separate from each other. They're both part of the same government. But... Uh, but they are distinct, and, and the question is how much independence does one have against the other? So uh, at that time in Geneva, there was no question of the church being independent of the government, uh, or, or sort of separate from it, I should say, um, and the government had an interest in what happened in the church, but what Calvin was fighting for was, uh, he was fighting against, I should say, uh, the government wanted to control what the church did uh, excessively so. And everywhere in the 16th century, the trend was towards greater government control. So Calvin uh, insisted, and Farrell insisted, that the church had a certain independence. 
And when the uh, government of Geneva uh, ordered them to adopt certain ceremonies from the neighboring state of Bern, um, they said, no, no, this is, uh, you know, you're, you're not the ones who rule the church. And so Calvin and, and Pharrell resisted, and they were, for the pains, they were sent off into exile and told to leave. So Calvin was a little bit upset with this, but uh, you might suspect uh, that this wasn't all bad news. So he went back to Basel to get back down to his, his, his time of study and quiet. However, that was not to be. And at Basel, uh, Martin Bucer, who was um, an older man, who was one of the reformers at Strasbourg, in uh, Strasbourg is currently in France, but then it was part of Germany, which it was for some time until um, sometime later when the French acquired it. Um, so Strasbourg was part of Germany, but had a French church. And uh, Bucer, who was one of the, the German reformers at, at Strasbourg, saw in Calvin a, a suitable leader for the French church at Strasbourg. Calvin was not over keen on doing it, but um, uh, Bucer had other ideas, and uh, he'd obviously learned from what, uh, uh, the way in which Farrell had detained Calvin. So again, I'll just read you Calvin's own words on this. He says, by this means set at liberty, that is by his being sent to exile, by this means set at liberty and loose from the tie of my vocation, I resolved to, li resolved to live uh, in a private station, free from the burden and cares of any public charge when their most excellent servant of Christ, Martin Bucer, employing a similar kind of remonstrance and protestation as that to which Farrell had recourse before, drew me back into a new station. Alarmed by the example of Jonah, which he set before me, I still continued in the work of teaching. So basically, um, Bucer said to Calvin, you know, are you being like uh, Jonah? Are you turning your back on God's call? Uh, you, must, you mustn't do that. You must come and continue in the ministry to which you've been called. So Calvin went to Strasbourg, where he spent um, about two years uh, in, in the ministry there. And that was an extremely important time for him in, in, in a number of ways. Um, that can perhaps be summed up by just giving you three names. First of all, I've already mentioned Martin Bucer. Uh, Bucer was a first-generation reformer. He, uh, he met with Luther in... Uh, the years between um, 1517 and 1521, so he was right there from the beginning of the Reformation. Um, and Bucer's theology was already quite developed, and Calvin was influenced by Bucer during his time in, in Strasbourg. So he learned from Bucer, learned um, aspects of his, his theology. 